Good evening, Pastor Rusty, Calvary Baptist Church. Well, it is an icy February night. Um, just came back from a walk and things are starting to ice up, so I hope nobody's out moving around. Um, kind of a dangerous night for that. It has been um, a sad week for Calvary. We have lost two members uh, this week. Um, most of you know about those, so keep keep in you know keep in prayer, um, Nancy Jett, and um, and also pray for Sue Jones, um, as they both lost husbands this week. And so be in prayer for that as it's ongoing, and they're um, in a time of transition. Also be in prayer for those that are that have been in and out of the hospital and ICU, still waiting on answers. We have a lot of people that have unanswered questions and things that they're waiting on. So. Remember one another in prayer. You know what? If you get an opportunity, I post on our Facebook page, um, on our private prayer page. Sometimes I'll post addresses where you can send cards and and just let people know. So if you don't care, you know, if you got a little house, take a little note. I mean, if you got a little uh, card in your house, take a little note, uh, note paper, drop it in the mail. Just say thinking about you um, and let them know people that you're praying for them. Uh, we'll let you know as any more details come up on on those. Um, but just continue to pray. Stay safe. Stay in. Um, we're still dealing with the COVID. Um, this nation is basically torn apart. Pray for unity and um, peace in our country as, as we go forward. Um, but let's continue tonight with our winter Bible study. We've been looking at strange stories in Scripture. And so I've been kind of waiting here just a little bit to let more people join us on Facebook to make sure that we have um, as many people as want to find us have found us. And it looks like we've got a pretty good number of people. So let's go ahead and we'll have a word of prayer and we'll get into tonight's Bible study. Father God, in Jesus' most precious name, um, we pray this evening for Father for those that have lost loved ones that are that are grieving. Father, it's it's never a good time to lose a loved one, but in in the midst of this pandemic, uh, Father, it makes things also more complicated. Um, our normal grieving process and funerary processes have changed so much. So, Father, I pray you'll bless these families, that you'll uphold them with your right hand, that you'll strengthen them and comfort them, um, and Father, walk with them as part of them has has gone away now. I pray that you will walk with these families and Lord, that you'll be with us as a church and, and for the members of the family and, and Father, help us to walk forward and trust you in all that we say and do. And Lord, this evening as we as we open up the scripture and look at um, one of your great kings from the Old Testament, I pray that you would um, enlighten us about wisdom, Father, that you would teach us what it means to be wise and to be knowledgeable and that, Father, as, as Proverbs says, that we wouldn't be, you know, wise in our own eyes, that we wouldn't think ourselves more greater than we should, but but trust your knowledge and your wisdom as we go forward. And it's in Jesus' precious name that I pray. Amen. Well, this evening we are going to be talking about Solomon. Um, Solomon, known to be the wisest person who ever lived until Jesus Christ. Even Jesus said, one greater than Solomon is here today. And that was quite offensive to the people in that day because they didn't they didn't want to believe that Jesus had any wisdom at all. They knew his his parentage or they, they thought that he didn't have any. And so um, let's take a look. Now we're talking about Solomon. So so we've had King David. We had King Saul. Then we had King David and then King Solomon followed. Now this was the United Kingdom of Israel. All 12 tribes were under one monarchy at the time. Um, Saul, David, and Solomon included. And then we see the kingdom split at the death of Solomon, and that's a whole other series of, of studies. Um, so we have the United Twelve Tribes. Solomon has just become king. Now Solomon's age, he's a young man at this point. Um, David has passed away of uh, ripe in age. Um, he prayed for Solomon. He, he prayed that the Lord would guide him. Solomon had watched how much God blessed David. He knew the promises that were given to David about an heir that would reign. And, and so all those things kind of go into the backstory of Solomon. But Solomon's 20 years old or younger when he becomes king. And so um, I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty young to me. I remember when I was 19 thinking I, you know, I could probably handle a kingdom. But looking back now at, at 54 and thinking, well, maybe, maybe not so well. I wouldn't want a kingdom today. I just don't think I could handle it. Um, it's beyond me. So so wisdom is one of those things that's kind of challenging uh, when we're younger in our youth. Uh, we do a lot of things that are unwise, and, and, and we don't really have wisdom, especially the wisdom I think we see with Solomon. So let me take you, first of all, to, to 2 Chronicles chapter 1. 
And the Bible says, Solomon, son of David, established himself in his kingdom. The Lord his God was with him and made him exceedingly great. Solomon summoned all of Israel, the commanders of the thousands and of the hundreds, the judges and all the leaders of all Israel and the heads of the families. Then Solomon and the whole assembly with him went into the high place that was at Gibeon. For God's tent of meeting, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, had made in the wilderness, was there. But David had brought the ark of, the ark of God up from kiriath Jerium to a place that David had prepared for it. He had pitched a tent for it in Jerusalem. Moreover, the bronze altar that Bazalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, had made was there in front of the tabernacle of the Lord. And Solomon and the assembly acquired, inquired at it. Solomon went up there to the bronze altar before the Lord, which was at the tent of meeting, and offered a thousand burnt offerings on it. So, so in Chronicles, we see a picture of, of Solomon coming to power, uh, ruling over all of Israel, and he, he does the, he, he's, a, he's a godly individual. He feared God, he loved God, and he knew that, that God had blessed David so greatly. And so, um, you know, the Lord God was with him, and, and he went up to the place of the altar, and he, he offered these thousand burnt offerings on it and during Solomon's day and you can read in Chronicles and you can read in First Kings and, and and you'll see that there were there was just offerings and sacrifices continually in Solomon's day and God blessed Solomon and, and the wealth in Solomon's day the gold and the silver were considered like dust in the ground there there was so much wealth to be had there was there the God had blessed the nation so abundantly with him and it's and it's such a beautiful thing to see uh, verse 7 goes on there in Second Chronicles chapter 1. It says, That night God appeared to Solomon and said to him, Ask what I shall give you. Solomon said to God, You have shown great and steadfast love to my father David and have made me succeed him as king. O Lord God, let your promises to my father David now be fulfilled, for you have made me king over a people as numerous as the dust of the earth. Give me now wisdom and knowledge to go out and come in before the people who also can rule this great people of yours. God answered Solomon, because this was in your heart, and you have not asked for possessions, wealth, honor, or the life of those who hate you, and have not even asked for long life, but have asked for wisdom and knowledge for yourself, that you may rule my people over whom I made you king. Wisdom and knowledge are granted to you. I will also give you riches, possessions, and honor, such as none of the kings who were before you, and none after you have the like. So Solomon came from the high place at Gibeon, from the tent of meeting to Jerusalem, and he reigned over Israel. So, so that's the Chronicles version. The chroniclers they would, they wrote down the histories of the kings, and 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 there was a, what, what's called a regnal formula. They they present the king. Later on, they talk about all the kings and and whether they did good or did evil in the sight of the Lord. And and for the northern kingdom, once they separate after Solomon. All the northern kings uh, did evil in the sight of the Lord, and, and very few of the southern kings actually did right in the sight of the Lord, but, but some did. So, so we know that uh, Israel and, it splits and becomes Israel and Judah, and, and, and Judah um, has some better kings, but overall, they're not really long for the land. About 500 years after this, and they're out of the land, um, less than that for the northern kingdom. Um, and so jumping over to 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 1, we have this same story told again, but then it goes into a different story, which is going to be the crux of our study this evening, this unique thing about Solomon. Now, there are many places that we can land that we can look at Solomon and, and, and see these things. Uh, we have the Queen of Sheba that came to see him in his wisdom and, and, and all these other things. And then there's a whole lot of bad things with Solomon, all of his wives and all of his concubines and and he created mansions and palaces for his wives, and, and they brought in their other gods, and, and Israel kind of falls into disarray under him. And, and to be so wise, he made so many foolish mistakes. But, but consider again, he's a 20-year-old. He prays this prayer at Gibeon. Um, and, you know, in, in, in um, 1 Kings chapter 3, it's rehearsed again, Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people able to discern between good and evil, for who can govern this, your great people? So you see humility. You see great humility and respect and understanding for God. First of all, Solomon as a 20-year-old, I think that's pretty fabulous. It's an amazing thing to see. Now I know he was groomed. He was a son of the king. He was a prince. He was destined to be king. God had already promised David that 
that Solomon would be, would be king, even though there was some infighting in the family. At the end of David's reign, there was a mess in the family, and, and, and David made sure that Solomon was the one that rode on his horse that was seen to be the future king of Israel just prior to David passing. And one of the things David told Solomon uh, before he passed, and you think about it, he's talking to, you know, 20 years old or younger, and he says, listen, Solomon, be a man. Um, be, be a man about things. You know, he, he doesn't mean to be cruel and things like that. He just, you know, own, own that God made you a man and do the things that, that, that men do. Live up and, and do the things that are proper and right and stand for what's right. And, and I think that's a beautiful sentiment that David passed on to his son. Um, and and, the, and the, the king's version goes on and says, it pleased the Lord that Solomon asked this. And then God grants him all that. Um, and, and the riches and the honor and all that that comes with it. But then in verse 16 of 1 Kings chapter 3, it says later, two women who were prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. So it goes right from God blessing in Kings. And, and Kings is in, in, in more of a chronological order of the events that happened to Solomon more than the book of Chronicles is, which chronicles the kings of both Israel and Judah. Um, kings kings kind of goes into more of the things that they did in their life. And so... So later, two women who were prostitutes came into the king and stood before him. Now, there's some argument on whether these ladies are prostitutes. The, the ancient teachers of, of Israel would say, well, they weren't prostitutes, but they were, they were women that were married to, to men that died, and, and, and they wanted to keep, they, you know, they had that Nazarite, they had that, that Levitical law on them, um, the Leverite law, that they had to have a son for that, the name of the one who died. And, and most of them, they didn't want to marry the younger brother and the younger brother and the younger brother and, you know, as we see that story with the Sadducees and Jesus where they ask him, well, whose wife is she in the, in the resurrection? Um, but I don't know. It, it, it seems pretty plain to me that these are, these are two, the, the words that's used here um, has to do with the two prostitutes. And they both had children. And they're living in the same house. Let's pick the story up. It says, later two women were the prost were, that were, who were prostitutes came into the king and stood before him. One woman said, please, my Lord, this woman I live in the house with and I gave birth while she was in the house. Then on the third day after I gave birth, this woman also gave birth. So we got two very, very, very young infants. We were together. There was no one else with us in the house. Only the two of us were in the house. Then this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. She got up in the middle of the night and took, oh, took my son away from me while your servant slept. Then she laid him at her breast and, and laid her dead son at my breast. And when I rose in the morning to nurse my son, I saw that he was dead. But I looked at him closely in the morning. Clearly it was not the son that I had born. But the other woman said, no, the living son is mine and the dead son is yours. The first said, no, the dead son is yours and the living son is mine. So they argued before the king. So imagine the king is sitting um, in his council hall, in his hall of judgment, and, and two prostitutes come in. I mean, you know, the, the, the chronicler, I mean, the, the writer of First Kings that wrote this uh, knew who they were. And, and so later on in, in his reign, so, so we have him at the beginning of his reign asking for wisdom and knowledge. And how do I know to come in and go out? And how should I carry myself? And how shall I handle the complicated issues of life? And, you know, it's not easy to see the truth of any situation. I I've been watching uh, the impeachment trial on TV while I've been doing some other studies and making phone calls, just kind of listening to what's going on. And, and you listen to the two sides, and, and they both come at it. And, and it's any, any, any time you see litigation going on where people are arguing and, and they're saying, well, this is the fact and this is how it should be represented, and another group saying this is the fact and this is how it be, it's a hard thing to know. And so Solomon, before he begins to make judgments and before he starts to take his kingly duties, he prayed and asked God for wisdom and knowledge. And now he's faced with um, two basically throwaway women in this society, in this era, with the way culture was. These two women that really wouldn't have mattered much at all. Um, they come in before him and they begin to argue right in the king's chambers, just, just arguing with one another back and forth. And, and, and that's got to be a little bit frustrating. I, I can think of a 20-year-old male and how... He may not deal well with that at all or may not even care about these kind of things. Um, but I love what Solomon says and what he does. And this is our, our focus this evening is on the wisdom that God gives. It says, the, the king said, the one says, this is my son that is alive and your son is dead. While the other says, not so, your son is dead and my son is the living one. 
So the king said, listen, I love this story because it's crazy. So the king says, bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. Then the king said, divide the living boy in two. Then give half to one and give half to the other. Interesting. So he's going to fix the situation by simply splitting the live son which we all know would then create a second dead son. And I can just imagine the gasps. And, you know, he's the king. First of all, you're not going to say much. Uh, you may not even cast your eyes upon him because he is the king and he has this authority to do so. And, and it probably seemed exactly crazy as it sounds to us that he says, bring me a sword, let's divide the child and share him evenly. But but we see that this is the wisdom that the Lord had given him. Um, and then and listen to what it says then. But the... Um, give half to one, half to the other. But the woman whose son was alive said to the king, uh, because compassion for her son burned within her. She loved her son so much. And, and see, Solomon knew that this would be the result. Please, my Lord, give her the living boy. Certainly do not kill him. The other said, it shall be the, neither mine nor yours divided. Well, by the reactions, the, the wisdom that Solomon had to, to even go this direction, to I mean, again, how do you know by looking at the story what's right and what's wrong? How do you know? Uh, you can come to it with opinions, and you can you can come to the, these different um, confrontations thinking you know what's right, but a lot of times we don't know what's right. And so you have two women that have both given birth three days apart, and they're standing there with two with a dead son and a live son. How are we to know? I mean, how can you judge that? Which one is the mother? And so Solomon, with the wisdom God gave him. As a 20-year-old, I want you to think about this. As a 20-year-old young man, the, the wisdom that God had given him, he, he responded. Then the king responded, verse 27 says, Give the first woman the living boy. Do not kill him. She is his mother. All Israel heard of the judgment that the king had rendered and stood in awe of the king because they perceived that the wisdom of God was in him to execute justice. Now think about that. The, the wisdom of God. And, and you think, how did Solomon get the wisdom of God? Well, he was raised and trained to be a king. He had gone through, you know, if you watch any of these um, period piece shows that are on TV, and you can learn about how kingdoms were, you know, from the Middle Ages and, and all the way back. And, you know, the tyranny of the kings of the ancient past and, and, and how their rule was law. And, and they didn't have, you know, anybody, they didn't have any Senate governing them. They didn't have any any house of representatives that governed them had anything else that had to, it was just the rule of the king and it was absolutely law we know by studying uh, about the medes and the persians and how their law couldn't even be reversed when the king said something it couldn't be reversed and so so looking at this and you think about solomon such a young guy 20 and he had this kind of wisdom that only comes from god now look look what god did in that he gave solomon the wisdom to know how to resolve this crazy scenario that he was faced with I, first of all, I'm kind of blown away that this even came to the king. I think it's a, an amazing thing that, that these two prostitutes had access to the king in his judgment hall so that he would preside over that. I, I, would, I would imagine that there would be other ways. And, and you know, just a few days old and, and, and this happened. I, I don't know if there were courts of appeal and, and this had been going on for a little while, but I seem to think that it just happened, um, that it was an immediate thing brought to the king for his judgment. And God blessed him the ability to see through the, the, the mess, through the illusion of truth, through the shifting of facts. Obviously, one of those, both of those women knew what had gone on. One of them knew exactly what had happened, knew exactly that her son had died and that she switched babies. She knew that to be a fact, yet she lied before the king and she pre presented a false scenario and a false set of facts. And and, and the king was able to see through this because God had given him that wisdom. Now, you talk about a strange story. Bring me the baby, let me divide it into you. think how maniacal, how, how evil of, of, a, of a heart Solomon must have had. But we have the rest of the story and we realize what he was getting at. He knew that the one whose son it was would love that son too much to see him cut in two. She would give him away first. And, and I, I, think, I think about... That's amazing wisdom and, and how, he, how he saw that and he knew to do that. And, and so you think about, think about wisdom. You can look at Psalm 72. Listen to what it says there. And this is a song of Solomon and he, a prayer for guidance and support for the king. Listen to Psalm 72. It says, Give the king your justice, O God, 
and your righteousness to a king's son, referring to himself as son of David. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. May the mountains yield prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the needy, and crush the oppressor. May he live while the sun endures as long as the moon throughout all generations. May he be like rain that falls on the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days may righteousness flourish and peace abound until the moon is no more. And it goes on in the same kind of tone and the same kind of verse um, in Psalm 72. And so think about again a young man, a young king that had this kind of heart. That he wanted to rule God's people. See, he wasn't power hungry. He wasn't he wasn't finances hungry. He wasn't army hungry. He wanted to do a good job that would honor God. Now, see, we live in a day and an age where everybody says what I'm doing is for the betterment of the people. But then we watch them when, when they get to D.C. And we watch them when they get there. And it's all about lining their pockets. And it's all about, you know, getting their bills passed. It's going to help their friends out. And it's all about the lobbyists. And, and I don't know if you, but, but, you know, the whole political system here in America is maddening right now with with all the division and all the fighting and 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 I don't know I don't know myself uh, uh where to stand on these things but I do know that there's a promise in James and it goes right along with this now we recently studied James the first of last year before covid hit we got into three or four chapters and and we managed to go ahead and finish the book of James on Wednesday nights but let me just remind you again what James chapter 1 says um he begins in, in verse 5, and he says, If any of you lack wisdom, if any of you are without wisdom, ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly it shall be given to you. So so even even James, later on, so many thousand years, you remember Solomon is, is you know, we're talking about 800 and some odd years before Christ. And and so this was written, you know, 800, you know, eight to 900 years later this is written, if any of you lack wisdom, ask God. See, God has been tested throughout the, throughout the years and throughout the eons and, and through his people that, that he grants wisdom to folk, to just people, to anyone who, who's lacking wisdom. Well, to me, it seems like a pretty wise person realizes they're lacking wisdom because I've known some very arrogant people who don't need help, don't need guidance, no, don't need direction. You know, I've got this, you know. I've got this, you don't have to worry about me. But but aren't we all in need of wisdom? And I think as myself as a pastor, how 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 do I pastor God's people? They're they're his, they're not mine. They're they're his and, and he loves everyone immensely and everybody comes with their own sets of complications. Everybody comes with their own truth as they see it. And then there's a truth that is truth. And, and, and sometimes people see things accurately. Sometimes people don't see things accurately. Sometimes me as a human man see things accurately. Sometimes I don't. And, and may we never, sometimes we, we realize we may never know the truth of the given situation until we get finished. Um, but James says, ask for wisdom, which is something that I grabbed onto when I was a young man, I mean a very young man, and I heard a sermon about Solomon asking for wisdom. And I, I mean, I'm talking about 40 years ago or more, probably more than 40 years ago, a sermon where the pastor talked about Solomon, and then he came to James and he said, if any of you lack wisdom. And I believed that in that moment. I accepted that as truth. And in that moment, I asked God to give me wisdom. Now, I haven't always acted wisely. I haven't always yielded to the Lord's wisdom. I haven't always been in a place where I can receive the wisdom. I haven't always paid attention to detail deep enough so that wisdom could be seen. Sometimes I fly off the handle, as some people say, or, or, or I barge in um, where angels fear to tread. And, and, you know, life is about learning, and wisdom builds upon wisdom upon wisdom. But, you know, the truth of the matter is we can begin this night, this evening, just as when Solomon said, cut that child in two and split the boy up. And, and that sounds crazy to us, but we see the wisdom in his actions. He he saw through what was there, and he found a place of resolution. Verse 6 in James 1 says, But ask in faith, never doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea 
driven and tossed by the wind. And, and you say, well, I know these verses. I've heard them before. Sometimes we need to be reminded to never doubt, to always trust that God, God gives wisdom to those that ask. He gave wisdom to a 20-year-old king over Israel. First, he allowed a 20-year-old to be king. But God had his hand on Solomon just as God has his hand on you, his child. He's watching over you. He has a, pla a path and a plan and a way for you to live your life. But without his wisdom, we make a mess out of things. So many people have completely messed up their lives that it seems like it's irrecoverable. But the truth is that God knows the path of wisdom. And if we pray for that and ask for that, I'm asking continually that God show me the path in this pandemic how to pastor, how to be what people need, not what they want. That's a whole other situation, but what they need. What's the path of wisdom? And in your life, maybe you're not a pastor. Maybe you're not a parent. Maybe, maybe you're not a boss. Or, or you know, maybe, maybe your life, you think it, it doesn't amount to anything, but, you know, there's a path of wisdom for you and an important life for you to walk. God's got that for you. And if we would just ask, ask. For, I've been asking for wisdom so that I can see as a pastor how to react to the things that are going on in the community and, and how to react. You know, at what point do, do I make a statement about the things that I see or, or do I teach the lessons that help us to then learn and to react properly? See, the wisdom is required in all life situations. And God promises wisdom to all who ask. I pray that tonight the, the thought of, of slicing a child in two is one of those what moments that, that when you read that you go, well, Pastor Rusty's right. That's an odd story. Maybe it's a story you've known and you've heard a hundred times in your life and to revisit it again and think, you know, how wise Solomon was. Jesus was wiser. Cast your trust upon him. Ask him for wisdom and then walk in that wisdom that he gives you, believing that he will give you that wisdom. And you're going to see massive changes, uh, illumination in your life, the ability to understand what other people cannot understand. And I hope that you're blessed by this tonight. I look forward to talking to you again. Remember those in our congregation that are suffering, that are hurting, that are grieving right now. Um, Pray for our community as we're in the middle of an ice storm. I don't want to lose my electricity tonight, um, but I know that I have a way to stay warm. But so many don't have a way to stay warm. So where you can help, please be a help. Where you can be a support, please be a support. And remember our communities. Remember our, our states, our cities. Remember our national government as we go into um, dark days ahead. But the light of Christ never changes. I'm Pastor Rusty. God bless you. Can't wait to talk to you later.